Good morning, everyone. I am Megha Sham Sinkar, and I am your host for today's webinar. I welcome you all on behalf of our entire Pentagraph team to this month Penta Talk series. As you know, Penta Talk series has been a platform that brings together brilliant minds and thought leaders from various fields to share their expertise and insight. It is our collective commitment to growth and continuous learning. I'm really excited for today's topic, which is startup and alternative asset class. And we have someone who has vast experience of 35 years across information technology, financial services, and startups in various capacity. Within financial services, he has worked across portfolio management, key account management, merchant banking, business development, research, investment advisory, private equity and investment banking, product management and wealth management, of course, startups and early stage fundraise, EB5 investing, alternative investment strategies. He's a co-founder and CEO of Finolutions LLP and co-founder of Finwall Ventures Private Limited. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming this dynamic personality, Mr. Apurva Vora. Hi Apurva, welcome to Penta. Please. Thank you, thank you very much. Apurva, uh, you have such a diverse, rich and impressive work experience. So we are really, really privileged to have you as a guest speaker today for our Pentadoc series. And I would like to tell all our participants that Apurva had also partnered along with players like Microsoft, ET Now, Airtel, SAP, Your Story, Voxlaw for multi-city talent hunt for startups, leading to a grand finale in November 2016 for selection of best five startups in the country. So who can be the best per person than Apurva to talk on today's topics of startups? So Apurva, uh, yes. we have heard about Hello India, Fit India, Correct. Correct. India Make It India. But there is a buzz around Startup India. In Get fact, it. startups have sort of become an attractive alternate asset class after India ranked third across the world where more number of startups turn into unicorn. So can you please share your views on startups, its current ecosystem, its current relevance, in terms of investment in today's investing world, what do you offer? Thank you. Thank you, Meksham, and thank you uh, to the entire team of Pentagraph for uh, giving me this opportunity. I think, uh, Meksham, to answer your uh, points in terms of the startup ecosystem and everything around that, uh, I would like to run through this presentation because I've tried to gather some interesting data and facts around startups. Uh, I always believe that when any subject is relatively new, while I don't call startup as a relatively new subject, but startup as an investment class is relatively new for a lot of people in India even today. It's very important that I talk the language of data and let the story that this data reveal be with the investor of its own. So I would prefer more of data centric stuff in my, at least the first part of the presentation. Uh, and for that, I would, prefer to run through a few slides, which will give and set the context of this entire startup ecosystem. So, so to make it uh, more meaningful, let me move to uh, uh, the slides and I, I can keep my video off so that we have a larger screen share available and we will be back on screen when required. So, so let me run through this presentation now. Just a second. So uh, 
by all means, let me start by a statement that startup by all means is a risky asset class. Right? It is one of the more riskier asset classes that we have around. Theoretically, there's a possibility of complete loss of capital, but it all depends upon what kind of capital you, you diversify into. But the most important part is that startup as an investment should be considered only by those people who by SEBI's definition fall under the criteria of being an accredited investor. So let me um, run through the slides and I will come back to the accredited investor uh, formula uh, in my later part of the presentation. So I generally start the presentation with this slide where I say that, you know, if you do not understand startups, let's not become judgmental about startups, right? Let's not make this particular mistake. Let's try and understand what the startup ecosystem is all about. I think in the opening note, we, you know, we spread Hello India, then we came to Startup India and yes, startup is like around everywhere across. Classic example of startup being around everywhere is take an example of a, of a burger. You go to a big brand, order a burger, you, are, you end up actually indirectly supporting quite a few startups by default. This is the nature of all micro cap businesses are. If this is not enough, the biggest proof is this year's IPL had 19 sponsors, which were theoretically a startup. So startups are around everywhere uh, around us now. It's not a new concept any longer. And we have the best of the brand ambassadors for startup. They are very important for the government now. And I'll give you a couple of examples for this. Uh, the first and foremost, this year's budget speech, if somebody would have gone through, there was 21 times reference of the word startup that came about in Nirmala Sitaraman budget speech. You know, I keep on saying that 10 years back, if we had a budget speech, the only word which could have been about 21 times referred in those presentations could have been agriculture. But today, we had 21 times the reference of startup word coming in. Clearly indicates that government is looking at startups in a very different way. We all understand that this country with a huge population, we are number one in population now in the world. There is no way we can have those formal employments getting created so easily. And therefore, there is no choice for anyone now, but for them to promote startups in a big way, which luckily enough, the government has been doing a great job as well. What actually led to the growth? So, you know, we, we just heard when, uh, you know, when this comment was that we are the third largest, uh, uh, you know, ecosystem in the world. This all largely became possible because of one very important trigger, which is a mobile data pricing. We are the cheapest in the world or amongst the cheapest in the world in terms of mobile data pricing, because of which the internet penetration in India has become so easy that we find internet everywhere across. On a much lighter note, I keep giving this example. Uh, I, I, I'm not able to place the name right now, but there was one Hindustan Lever uh, chairperson who made one comment years back, saying that you go to any village in, in, uh, in India, you will, you will find two things for sure. One, a Hanumanji temple, and the second is an HUL product. This was a statement made by this gentleman years back. Uh, I think now you have the entire world in any remotest of the village in India with internet connectivity and mobile in hand, right? Uh, that is what the power of internet data has, has done, which led to what we call the internet economy or startups. That mushroomed in India in a big way. Just because of this cheap data, UPI became a masterstroke. Jandan became possible. All this would not have happened if internet data was so, so you know, easily not accessible to average Indians. On top of it, India's absolutely brilliant demographics is going to help India much more. The youngest population, we will continue to enjoy this benefit for very long. That means that you know, while the youngsters have actually embraced internet economy or startups in a big way, even the senior citizens in, in this country are now hooked up, whether it is YouTube, whether it is something else, whether it is digital payments, they are all quite comfortable with the new way of life. All this in almost no time. 
I think there is no there is no credible metrics which I have in front of me to say. But we are, I can I can assume that we are one of the best in terms of internet adoption also, despite an overall feeling that we are not educated enough. So I think this has been the reason for revolution. But some important interesting data set now. We are the third largest ecosystem in the world in terms of number of startups. We have 99,380 startups which are registered in the country as of now. This is data is on 31st of May this year. Uh, I'll come to the other part, but the important part is about 7.9% of the startups are funded. That means that bulk of the startups that we see today are, are absolutely not funded only. Now, not every startup would need funding. If I start my own business, if I have capital enough for me to run the business, and if my aspiration is not to become a significantly large player, I can do my business without external money. This is something which has happened years back also. We were not using the word startup at that time. We were all calling it as business. I have invested in business. I am doing my business. Today, the moment I have a desire to take money from someone, is the word startup comes in, in picture. Some data set which I have ignored here, purposefully because government also publishes the data of dead pool startup, which we believe you can't get a correct answer ever. But the funded startups in India, if it is only around 8%, now we need to understand and, and because the objective of this presentation at the end of the presentation is, how do we make judgment around startup investments? Then let me highlight this, that this 7.9% is a very important number for us to track. We do not consider friends and family investment as legitimate funded startups, because that is something which is not because of the reason that you like the business, but it is because of obligation that most of the time the investments happen. So the funding that happens to companies outside of friends, families, and fools, as they say, is 7.98%. Now, as we as investors in startup actually evaluate one more thing, we try to figure out how many of this have qualified investors and how many of them have just investors. If I'm presenting my startup idea to a group of five people and one out of them comes back to me in the evening and says, your idea was good enough. Can we participate in the idea? Can I be the partner in the business? Now that is the biggest validation that my startup is making sense to somebody outside. But just because there is an investor does not make it a qualified investment. So 7.98% of the startups do get external funding, but we also apply one more filter. Is your startup having any qualified investor? And that answer has to be yes for us to start evaluating the startup. Till that time, we do not even evaluate a startup. Now, how do we define a qualified investor? For namesake, this is not a reality that I'm talking about, but just for namesake. If suppose Vijay Shekhar Sharma of Paytm was to invest in a startup, one school of thought says that because he has built a startup from grounds up, he knows the startup ecosystem very well, therefore he could be considered as a qualified investor. One school of thought believes that he's a qualified investor for FinTech, but he's not a qualified investor for other markets or other themes. So if Vijay Shikhar Sharma is investing in an OTT platform, I would not call it as a qualified investment because he might be doing it for diversification. He's not a domain expert in OTT platform. So I further filter this 7.99% and look at how many qualified investors do startups have. Roughly, this is not an exact number, but roughly that answer is around 4%. Other universe for looking at startups now filters down to only 4%. Generally speaking, 1.58% of the startups in India do get acquired. This is far lesser number than most of the other developed markets in, you know, as of now. We are very sure that this number will undergo a change. In India, we do not see a culture where a large organization keeps acquiring a lot of startups to become bigger and bigger. But that's very typical in the US. You look at entities like Amazon, Netflix, Cisco, Microsoft, uh, IBM, they are all Google, uh, you know, of all, they all have a lot of acquired startups, which they make part of their group subsequently. Not everybody is capable of doing R&D and become an expert. 
Look at the entire Google ecosystem. YouTube was acquired. Their own messenger Orkut. Nobody, and you know, I don't know how many of us would have had an account in Orkut ever. We all preferred WhatsApp over that. So it's not possible for someone to be able to create all the winners. But to acquire a good growing business is something which is a lot more easy. And this is how US operates. Now, if I look at some of the, and why is we use the word startup ecosystem? There have been 113 startups which have got generated out of the alumni network of Mintra. A company which is not known so much in the startup ecosystem to an average Indian. 318 startups have come out of Flipkart ecosystem. Somebody who would have been part of Flipkart in the initial days would have learned how to scale businesses. 318 of them, it's an interesting number. You will not find this so easily happening in, in case of large listed entities because it's not easy to do that. But in India also, we believe that listed entities will start acquiring more and more startups in the, in the days to come. And we are already seeing each one of them having their own in, internal startup cell. Now to identify good startup ideas so that they can come out and invest. This is a clear indication that the ecosystem is growing and growing very fast. Another interesting data for us to look at, despite a huge uh, you know, potential of the Indian startups, bulk of the Indian startups are being funded by global investors. You look at the rightmost column on your screen, only 26% of the investors in India, uh, in the startup ecosystem in India are Indians. 74% of the investors are outside of India who invest in startup ecosystem. Now that is understandable for a country like Indonesia where they do not have a very strong uh, you know, inv investor base of their own. But India housed to so many ultra HNIs and still bulk of the money coming in from foreign entities is a clear indication that the foreigners have much bigger belief in the Indian startup ecosystem than what we as Indians have today. This actually speaking is no different than what was happening close to about 10, 15 years back, when even in the listed equity markets, it was the FIIs which had more belief in India than we as domestic Indians. We believe a similar situation is likely to happen here, where now slowly steadily the Indian investors will start moving into the startup and start allocating more money to startups in the days to come. Another thing for us to look at, for a seven year period, if somebody is investing in uh, in any uh, asset allocation portfolio, a 20% allocation to VC kind of a, uh, alternate investment ends up around 30% in terms of the portfolio returns at the end of seven years. So it is this segment which contributes the highest in terms of the returns for a long period of seven years. Obviously, startups as an investment asset class can be considered only for long term. This can never ever be a two-year, three-year, five-year kind of a strict investment ideas. You need to give slightly more time, five years and above on an average. While past performance is not necessarily the indication for future returns, all the category one angel funds, which essentially invest in startups, the cumulative performance of this over a period of time has been 37.08% compounded annually. And that is after expenses. By all means, this is something which is very interesting. Having said this, and while this is the data, two observations or two important statements that I need to make. The first is in the year 2014-15, the returns look very bad, largely because at that time, the internet economy had not really been thriving in India. It started off only there. So the early days startups were not solving any important problem for an average Indian. And therefore, those kind of startups would not generate higher returns was understandable. The entire VC ecosystem was not strong enough that the startups can get exit. Leaving those aside, the return numbers look very nice. Despite all this, we need to keep one thing in mind. If you are an investor in listed equity, ideally speaking, and this number can vary, ideally speaking, one should expect about 12% kind of returns year on year out of listed equity. If that is the case, then expectation of, out of private equity should be 20%. Expectation from venture capital, uh, sorry, private equity should, should be 16%. Venture capital should be 
and angel investing should be 24%. Your 16, 20, and 24 should be the benchmark for P, VC, and angel investing. The interesting thing is, this industry is expected to grow threefold in next three years. The expectations are, these are expectations from knowledgeable people like Mr. Mohan Daspai, who uh, in their research output, they call this as a 3x in three years kind of a scenario. Even if someone was to say that, you know, Mr. Pai is optimistic about Indian startups a little too much, even if this doesn't turn out to be 1.5 and it settles at 1.2, maybe one, we're still seeing a significant amount of growth for the startup system in India. Very quickly, why do we like startups? Or this is more to do with the entire unlisted space. What do we mean by investing in angel stage? It's a company or it's a startup where the participation is in the early stages of business, often pre-revenue, or in some cases, there may not even be any custom. Now, if you look at private equity, the wording says businesses with profitable margins, stable cash flows, and ability to service significant amount of debt. Just take a pause. Without naming, some of the companies that came in 2022 with IPOs, startup companies, how many of them had profitable margins? How many of them had stable cash flows? And very few had the ability to service significant amount of debt. Actually speaking, there were late stage VC companies which came in the IPO market. And then it led to the bad name for the entire startup ecosystem. Those kind of valuation crashing is understandable. But when somebody is investing in angel stage, when there is no revenue, there are no customers. But once the product is or service is introduced and you have 1,000 paying customers that comes in, close to 2,000, why would there not be a more uptick in valuation in that stage? Right? Because then you are showing attraction, which is not words. And obviously then, as a businessman, you would start valuing those kind of startups slightly more. The risk in startup is about the mortality. How many of them survive is the question mark. So we move to the next slide for us to understand. It's a very simple slide for us to understand. Now, if from a stability point of view or somebody who is a, a conservative investor would always say that you would want to invest in a Series B plan because you know that this plan now is likely to survive for sure. I mean, a great possibility of its survival. Now, suppose this plant is available for, I'm hypothetically putting some numbers, that if this plant was available for 1,000 rupees, I'm giving this 1,000 rupees because of I see predictability that this plant will survive. And I will invest into this plant at 1,000. Possibly, the value of this plant over the next five years could grow to 2,500. I would be happy that I'm making 14, 15, 16% kind of yield on my investment, compounded annually. But when a startup investor looks at the entire opportunity of making money, they look at it very differently. A startup investor will not buy a plant for 1,000 rupees. Instead, I will decide that I will go and buy a packet of 100 seeds for 1,000 rupees and plant those 100 seeds. Out of those 100 seeds, there are great chances that 10 or 15 will become a Series B kind of a plant if they are nurtured well. And that is where from 1,000 rupees, my aspiration will be to make 10,000 or 15,000 rupees. Now, there are two ways of looking at it. One set of investors will say that 85% of the startups fail. One set of investors will say, the 15 that grow will compensate everything. I don't care for what happens to the remaining 85. I will focus on the 15 that grows because that's where my returns are going to come from. So two sides of the same coin. A pessimist will always look at, oh, 85 startups have gone. This is a bad way to invest in. But you should, as an investor in startup, should look at a couple of things very carefully. You must have a diversification in the portfolio. And if well diversified, you should not focus on how many startups fail, but what is your portfolio value becoming at various stages. That matters to an investor the maximum. If we are concerned about few startups in the portfolio failing, Temperamentally, we are not cut out for startup investments. 
the entire AIF industry, which has been the fastest growing industry in India, right? If you look at the entire pie chart of where the number of AIFs are, bulk of them are in the private equity venture capital space. There are some of them in angel investing space as well. Listed equity and hedge funds account collectively for only 14% of the total pie chart. Right? So large, the much larger industry is the PE and VC industry. Angel industry, which is where we fall into, will look at the larger PVC funds for getting our exits. Very good to see the synergy between the two in terms of numbers. Why we are even more optimistic about startups now, let me come to that slide. In year 2022, which was actually one of the worst year for startups, we had the maximum number of startup funds which got registered. Here, the fund managers, the venture capitalists, the private equity guys, the angel investor guys, they all look at the market very differently. In the listed equity space, the moment markets crack by 10%, we become conservative. In this space, the moment market op uh, provides the opportunity in great valuations, people jump into this and say, this is the time to invest because you are investing in businesses. You are not investing in an end product called share. With this, we saw the highest number of registrations in 2022. Interestingly enough, in the same year, even the VC fund count was the highest, which means that even if I were to launch a fund now, I have a higher chance of exit because there are more VC funds also, which are getting registered in this period. And therefore, we believe that these are interesting times now for startup to get mainstream. It's not too far away where startups will find a place in investors' portfolio as part of an allocation. Who can invest in this? Any investor who has at least two crores of tangible assets, excluding the principal residence, SEBI calls this as a accredited investor for engine investing. If an investor is an LLP or a private limited company, then the net worth criteria is 10 crores. But otherwise, the net worth criteria of an investor is two crores. It don't need a, char a chartered accountant certificate for the net worth. The investor will self-certify and say that you know, I am two crores or higher in terms of my net worth. I am a qualified investor. That's good enough. For a body corporate to invest, if it's a private limited company which wants to invest in startups, they have to give a net worth certificate from a chartered accountant where the net worth should be 10 crores or higher. These are the basic criteria for someone to come in and invest. This is the end of my first part of the presentation on why startups. I think we will take some questions around this and then possibly we will move to the second part of the presentation at that time. Thanks. Thanks, Apurva. Thanks for such good data points. Apurva, you, you. Uh, invested in various start startups across India, uh, USA, Israel. Correct. What are your learnings on this investment and why did you invest across the geographies? Uh, so good question. Uh, first of all, I was very clear that there are certain opportunities which you might not get in India. So you should be open to overseas startups also. If you are able to find the right platform. So in India, my worry is not so much about the platform. I worry more about the startups. If I'm investing outside, I should worry more about the platforms because I want the platform to be alive to be able to you know, get me an exit. Right. So you're, you're taking two risks, the risk of the startup and risk of the platform. Given all this, uh, first thing that thematically which we felt is that India is still in the early stages. And this I'm talking about 2015-16 when I started taking my initial interest in those investments. So one thing which was very stark, which is coming to us was the biggest thing in the entire startup ecosystem is your ability to get exit. Not too many people talk about it, but you need to have your ability to get your exits. Now in India, when you don't have an ecosystem where larger players acquire smaller players so easily, exit could be a challenge. So I wanted to experiment first with those kind of investments where the exitability could be more. And therefore, 
the first investment that was made was not in India, but first was made outside of India and US straight. That was a big risk that I had taken at that point of time. Uh, there are certain geographies which are extremely popular for special themes. So, so for example, uh, if it is cyber security, uh, by all means, Israel is a world leader in that space. Extremely difficult for someone to beat them. We found one company which was doing a very good job in, in Israel. And 95% of the investors were in US. And the company was then moving its headquarters and the important CXOs to US. It was a time I felt that now that they will become more exposed to US markets by physically being there, Possibly two, three years, they might get an exit to a good large VC fund in the US will acquire this. And therefore, this might be an interesting investment for one to make. So that was the thought process with which you took a call in that Israeli uh, investment as well. India is a different ballgame completely. Uh, because exits are a little bit of challenge. When I was looking at investing in India in my initial days also, I had this in mind that you, ideally speaking, should piggy bank upon the larger players rather than doing too much of a due diligence of your own because larger players will have here we are much more hierarchy driven uh, in terms of uh, the startup ecosystem the larger players dominate uh, in a lot of developed markets everybody has a niche of its own and even the soft bank could not beat a small player in that niche area so there you have to identify niche in India, the, the strength does matter. So we said the investment style has to be different. And having played the role of, uh, you know, having been part of so-called shark thing, the name was not there, but having played those kind of roles, had good understanding how, uh, you know, some of these people get, uh, get evaluated by larger players. So that was not too difficult in terms of putting the framework in place as to how do you want to sort of invest in each of these geographies and which theme to work on. And you will still have your own failures. There is, you can't escape failures in this kind of investments. And I also had mine. Okay. So if I were to ask you, what has been your most successful investment and failed investments? And what was your thought behind both in initial stage while, while before investing into it? So, so good question. Uh, let me talk about the failure first, because that's always good to speak first. So there was a online grocery shop. They will call it, it as grog shop is where I had invested in two years back. Thinking that the pattern of uh, consumers will change. And this was slightly uh, ahead of time. Uh, and you did not have some of the larger players uh, at that point of time. So I thought this would be fine and possibly if there is a larger player who will come and look at this kind of an exit, uh, you might have an exit opportunity also. But what quickly realized is that uh, not only that the burn of the promoters was a little too high, uh, they were all very hyper-local uh, you know, markets uh, catering to a certain segment. For someone to acquire segmental players, if you're operating in a certain area in Bangalore, for a larger player to come and acquire and become a national player, you will have to pick up 100 such startup ideas to become a national player, which, which is very difficult for you to acquire that many number of startups. And therefore, if that kind of a company is burning capital, and if it is not in the radar of the larger player, uh, it is bound to fail. So I think it was a mistake that I made in terms of overestimating the capacity of the founders for them to be able to raise money. It's important that the founder should be able to raise money in two or three rounds of his own, after which he's generally out of gravity. Here, the gravity forces from the bottom was a little too heavy and it failed, which was, which was one good learning that I had. Uh, my, what turned out to be the best investment, not that I thought it was going to be the best investment, was one company, uh, again, based out of Bangalore, uh, by name Observe.ai. They were automizing the entire process of uh, call centers. And they were, uh, they were into some very, very interesting businesses. So what they, and I'll take two minutes only to explain, but this is an interesting uh, uh, case study. So what they felt is that, you know, you 
call up any call center and they will say that this call will be recorded for quality purposes and all that kind of stuff is what we hear. For almost every such 100 agents, there would be 3% of the calls which will be actually heard by someone. And we'll try and figure out how many of the customers on the other side were happy on the call. But the sample size can't be more than 3% if somebody is doing this entire exercise manually. Plus, it is also subject to too many things. If you are tired by the end of the day, your grading of the call will also be subjective. And this is bound to have subjectivity because it's a very monotonous job. It is not easy to do that kind of a job. So there's this gentleman called Socknail from Bangalore, uh, you know, great pedigree. Uh, he got into this business to say, 100% of the calls will get recorded on almost on real time basis. It will run using machine learning, artificial intelligence. It will figure out whether the customer on the other side of the call was happy or not. If not, it is escalated to the supervisor almost immediately. So in the 10th minute, you will get a call and say, make sure you were unhappy with this call or uh, you have any other concerns on the call. The entire client servicing standard can go up many fold up by doing this exercise. And they're lucky enough that in three and a half years time, this company of course grew like, like anything in four years, I made about 27 X the money uh, when I got an exit about three months back out of this. So there could be all varieties, but thought process in one case uh, was that they are doing something which is really innovative. Luckily enough, they already had a uh, few strong customers in place and a couple of very, very large venture capital fund backing them up, uh, grounds up at the very first stage, which actually helped uh, me to take those decisions to invest that much more. Great, great. Uh, Apurva, now, you know, the, we, we are getting a situation of funding winter. So, so we, are, we are into that uh, uh, scenario. So what, what is the merit of investing in startups now when there is a funding winter? Right. So, make sure the reality is there is funding winter. There is no second thought about it. There is. Right? This is not only... Uh, International, this is in India as well, and across the board, it is there. Uh, you name a theme, there is not a single theme which will come out and say that this theme is something which is great. Uh, there was a stage when in the early days of COVID, everybody thought education will undergo a transformation, therefore edtech will be the best. Right. When Jandhan and everything got announced, fintech became a big buzzword and said fintech is the best by all means. Today, this winter is such that it is affecting everyone. It is not sparing practically anyone. Uh, but when do you invest? The fundamental question. Right? You invest at the time when everything is really rosy, then you will say that the valuations are too high. Sure. You have to invest at the time when valuations are reasonable. That's one. Uh, the other thing is, how long will the winter last? We do not know. But one thing is there, the data that I just showed, if you have more number of funds like never before, that kind of number is getting registered. There is definitely a higher degree of demand which is going to come for quality startups. On top of it, when I say that we would have filtered list where we would go with qualified investors as co-investors, there's a logic behind it. If you and I were to invest in a startup and if the startup does reasonably well, when we want to exit, both of us will have to start looking at our phone book to figure out how many venture capital funds we know so that we can go and talk to them and say, why don't you look at this company? I mean, if you and I are not in the ecosystem of startups, how many venture capital funds phone numbers would you have on your phone? Mm -hmm. Right. You will have all asset management companies, CEOs, phone numbers on your phone. Right. But the venture capital industry is very different. If you don't have that access, if you don't have that network, where will the exit come from? So it's very important to be part, you know, be investor with that bunch of people who have access. Then the startup winter, you can't change the winter, but this kind of mechanism at least will give a blanket to you. Right, right. And then you will be able to enjoy the good times much better. Great, great. So you have touched upon the 
most important uh, principle of Warren Buffett, uh, be, be greedy <laughs> when others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy. And I guess it, it is applicable to all the asset class, including Absolutely. The, uh, early stage funds. Apurva, uh, you have recently partnered with uh, India Accelerator to create a platform for uh, startup investments and you came up with your own early stage AI fund. Can you please brief us about the fund, its structure and about India Accelerator? Uh, we'll do that. Let me run through a few slides on that. And at that time, I will also talk and elaborate more on what an accelerator is and how does it add value to the entire value prop. Just a second. So the name of the fund is uh, View Opportunities Fund. Uh, before I come in uh, into this, let me uh, very briefly tell you what we have done even before launching the fund in the last about eight, nine months, quickly. So like a lot of other startup platforms do, uh, we also decided that we would start offering some individual startup ideas to, uh, uh, to wealth managers like you, who can take those uh, some of those ideas to your investors if it fits fine. Now, that would mean that we start showcasing individual ideas and the investor takes a call which startup the investor wants to invest or give it a pass. This is more like giving stock recommendations saying that this is a good stock, you go out and buy this stock if you want to. And then the judgment whether to buy this stock or not rests with the investor. When we launch the fund, we are converting the same research same network, same knowledge into a fund structure now. Saying we will manage the fund. There also you have to give me a commitment of 25 lakhs to be invested over a period of time. Here also I will take a commitment of 25 lakhs, but we'll invest over a period of time. So now with that little bit of a background, what we did at that time, I come to the fund part. This is SEBI regulated, SEBI registered category one angel fund. The only AIF category in India where the minimum ticket size is not one crore, but the minimum ticket size is 25 lakhs. This 25 lakhs is to be paid over a period of time. It's not to be paid up. So it's a small allocation that you create in your portfolio for allocating that money to startups via this SEBI regulated structure. Uh, this involves all the kind of regulations on us in terms of what the reporting should be to the investors, to SEBI and everything. This entity Finwall got created as you know a little over a year back with a joint venture between two entities. India Accelerator, which is my JV partner. Uh, a little background about this. They've been in business since uh, 2017, early 2017 types. Uh, this is part of the global accelerator network. But before I get into any of these things, let me jump to what an accelerator is for some part of the audience who may not be aware of. An accelerator in very simple terms, if I were to talk about, it's like, it's like a university for startups. In Delhi, we have about little more than two lakh square feet of space where startups get groomed. Startups apply for an accelerator program. So the entire journey is that there could be uh, a startup which could be from IIT Mumbai, uh, what they call an incubation center of IIT Mumbai, Incubation is just incubation of an idea. The moment idea has to grow, you have to grow and move to an accelerator. So world's largest accelerator or the most popular accelerator is a US-based entity by name Y Combinator. Y Combinator, only one thing I will tell you, which will tell you the story as to how strong Y Combinator is. Uh, in India, we have 108 unicorns. As on date, Unicorn means those companies where the valuation is you know, a little over 8,000 crores uh, currently. Y Combinator alone has about 130 unicorns in their portfolio. That's significantly large in terms of what they do. A lot of startups have aspiration. So if somebody wants to do, you know, hardcore science PhD, the aspiration would be to go to MIT for uh, getting their admission there. Same way startups will have an aspiration that you should be in Y Combinator to undergo that program. 
Now, just to give an example, uh, an accelerator will invest very little money in some cases. In some cases, they don't invest any money. They allow the startup to be there in their program, uh, in their center. They groom them. They give a lot of uh, soft inputs, some uh, additional other inputs as well, help them grow. In turn, they take a small equity in that business on day one. So when Airbnb was an idea, Airbnb approached Y Combinator. Y Combinator said, we will give you $20,000. We'll give you space. We'll give you a little bit of mentoring. Then you will grow of your own. That $20,000 invested by Y Combinator at the time of the IPO became 3,420 times the value. We will run out of calculator in terms of finding the percentage returns. So the startup comes in. I, let me give you an example. If suppose, uh, and this is important, then we will be really fast in uh, the next few slides. If suppose I am passing out from IIT Chennai and I have an idea that I want to make a derivatives app so that even housewives can invest in derivatives very easily. Now, that's a nice mission that I have in my mind. The challenge will be that I need a lot of people to support me. So I apply for an accelerator, I go to India Accelerator, join there. They will have a lot of corporate tie-ups. So they will have tie-ups with Motila Loswal, with HDFC Securities, few others in financial markets. They'll put me across to the derivatives head of one of those entities for all inputs about the markets and all. Once I'm mentally ready, I will go to them and say, I want to make a mobile app. They will say, fine, you go to cabin number so-and-so, our software team is sitting there. They will make the mobile app for you. Now, then I said that while this is fine, I need someone to help me with SEBI license because this business requires SEBI license. They will say, fine, you go to cabin number so-and-so, the corporate legal team is sitting there. They will apply on your behalf to SEBI also. There is digital marketing, there is market research, there are all these kind of functions which are in-house available within the same periphery. Now, one question to anyone here, a startup getting groomed from this, this kind of a center versus this startup getting groomed outside, will there not be quality of uh, difference in quality? There's bound to be. So India Accelerator was awarded as the best accelerator in India last year by the government of India. They've done about close to 200 odd startups have groomed there, about 30 odd uh, exits, th sorry, 30 odd failures, about 85, 90 odd uh, you know, exits. And the portfolio is a little more than seven times in six years uh, is the kind of uh, returns that they've been able to generate for themselves there in that structure. We as Finolutions, we have been a firm focusing on due diligence for various investment options. And also the we have seen a lot of investment options on one side of the table. So when we were designing our own product, we had this in mind that the loopholes or the areas where we can improvise uh, against what is prevailing in the market is what we should try to do whenever we launch our own product sometime. With that thought process, we moved into the fund together with a strong partner like India Accelerator. This is a 50-50 JV. So the fund construct is simple. Uh, it's a seven-year fund, predominantly investing in a pre-series A kind of uh, a stage of startups. But we will be sector agnostic. We do not want to look at education is a great theme, so I want to invest there. We will have you know, one or two ideas within that space where we feel they are path breaking, but not that just because there is a, uh, there is a great uh, you know, buzz around that word, we will go out and invest. The fund size is 100 crores. My SEBI document says I can do another 100 crores as well as a green shoe, but our intention is to close the fund at 150 crores of size. We might not go beyond that. So that is what the target fund size is. The minimum investment or the minimum commitment is 25 lakhs, of which 20% is paid upfront. The remaining money is paid every six months uh, in four equal installments. Management fee is 2% charged annually, only on the money that you have contributed, not on the capital that you have committed to your 25 lakhs. There is no setup fee. SEBI allows us to charge a setup fee, which is to recover the entire legal cost and the cost of applying to SEBI for this license and all. We decided we don't want to charge our set of fee. Also to the investor, we will bear that on our head. Usually the operating expenses, which are roughly about 30 basis points uh, you know, for every year, 
is towards uh, the audit fees to be paid, the uh, custody charges, the uh, trusteeship fees, fund accounting and all, which is always charged extra to the client usually as an industry practice. That also we said, a complicated asset class like startup, we want to make your account statement look simple at least. So let's not compl complicate any of these things. After the 12% of uh, returns annually to the investor, there's a 20% of profit share that we charge. Only after the entire portfolio capital is returned back. After the return of capital, the 80-20 rule will apply. We will be investing with this 25 lakhs, we'll be investing in 35 startups. If you go back to the slide, which I showed earlier of this plant and planting of 100 seeds and all that kind of stuff, the same logic applies here as well, that if you are in a nice cultivated environment, and then if you plant your 35 seeds here, we see quite a few number of seeds which will turn into plants which we would keep exiting. We'll not even wait till series B for our exits in many often cases. So about 35 startups, two thirds of those startups will be in, typically in pre-series A. 75% of the startups will have strong co-investors, domain experts, or qualified investors. Because we are diversifying into 35, we will take certain bets on early stage startups when there are higher degree of confidence that we have. We could also do some kind of secondary market deals if that kind of scenario is available, which we believe many times is available. So we might do that also. Uh, typically not more than 2% and uh, you know, not more than 6% and not less than 2% of the total committee will go to a single startup. Uh, we do not intend to keep uh, equal weightage portfolios. So for, uh, you know, there will be weighted average where there is higher conviction, we might take slightly higher bet as compared to others. So this is more like a typical portfolio approach, actively managed portfolio approach is what we will have about the fund. Primary thought process being that we will invest into high quality early stage and growth stage companies driven by technology with visionary founders who can create disruptive uh, and market leading business models. I'm being very honest here. This is something which not only me, any player in this business will speak the same thing. So you may discount these two first lines uh, very frankly. One thing which we are very clear, which we will very strictly follow is a portfolio approach. We will be very cognizant of that, what kind of portfolio that we end up creating. It has to have all kinds of balances that we, one needs to have. But the most important part is we will normally not go out and invest into any company which is trying to create a new market. We feel that that is a very expensive thing to do. If you are removing the inefficiencies of the existing, existing market, you tend to do better. I will give a classic example of Meru versus Ola. Ola was not the first to be in this business, but it figured out the mistakes of earlier business model, rectified, came with a bigger amount of money backing up and we're able to disrupt. We don't mind investing in a company which is creating market. If there is no, if there is no market for some new thing, which we, you and I even don't know, but if Reliance Industries gets into a segment and say, we will make potatoes out of something, I would still go out and invest because they have money for them to back up that no second line will get created so easily. So we'll take a note of this when we make any investment decisions. Five things are very important to us. The fifth is the pillar, but let me first talk about the first four. Founders and leaders, at the end of the day, you are betting on the jockey. That person who is going to drive the business should have the capabilities to do that. There has to be market differentiation and some kind of a technology edge. Then it makes sense for us to look at that company. There should be great market potential of, of that particular business. We come across many, many startup ideas and some of them, we, we actually don't laugh at it, but we feel sorry about some of these founders, to be honest. We had someone who came and said that, you know, we can. We have created a, a mobile app by which you can order prasad of any temple of your choice and we will get it delivered to you uh, in 48 hours or whatever. I mean, my first question is what is the potential of this? 
would you enjoy a tirupati prasad without being in the queue for four hours or six hours i don't think so we will ever enjoy that kind of prasad there is a difference between a laddu and a prasad you're trying to convert a prasad into a laddu and deliver it at home that's not a business model which will work we believe that and that's our understanding we could be wrong i don't know right scalability and growth of business is very critical for us one thing which i would want to highlight and i request this audience to do this as well when i saw, spoke about market potential i might say that this business will never flourish i'll tell you there are a lot of times it happens that some of those businesses turn out to be unicorns of a big order everybody would have laughed at the idea of airbnb at one point of time but it worked so there is one venture capital fund international giant by name bessemer partners bessemer venture partners they have one particular tab in their website very few people in the world would dare to do this and i really appreciate this fund from the bottom of my heart they are brilliant bunch of people so in their fund there is a tab which is known as lost portfolio earlier they used to call it as wall of shame now in this business there is something which is known as wall of fame if i have made 10 great investment in my office on my wall i will pull put logos of those 10 companies and probably say these are the companies where i invested in bessemer partners have something in their office which is known as wall of shame ideas that they rejected saying these ideas will never work and some of the companies were airbnb apple tesla coinbase and few others right when tesla came to them they said this they said this is great idea but the valuation is crazy instead let me buy a car the founder of bessemer partners said let me book a tesla car because it is subsidized let me enjoy the car and let someone else pay for the private equity money i don't care and he only got the car he missed out the 30 billion dollar valuation of tesla there are right that's the reason why the call is as lost portfolio i would suggest every and i will share this link with uh, with nekham as well this is something which makes sure you should circulate to everyone it's a, it's a great learning for everyone so these four pillars back on one thing that we will always look at the exit potential of the company before invest because at the end of the day we are not going to run this business we are investors we want to come for an, for a return from multiplier return and walk out this is a repeat i will so the key team and last two three slides now key team my co-founder ashish bhatia and me are the two principal people who uh, have to take bulk of the decisions in terms of startups the other gentleman that we have uh, mr dhananjay is a former risk and compliance officer uh, from aditya capital worked uh, for 38 years in uh, three different organizations which is bank of america indian and noida aditya billa capital all the risk and compliance officers of the group were reporting into him and he turn would report uh, he in turn was reporting into uh, kumar mangalam batla so when i we and ashish were looking at third partner for us to look at the key team member we chose somebody like dhananjay for two important reasons one very important reason one not so critical reason the important reason was that we wanted one person in the group to be the one who should be in a position to put the foot down and say this is the lakshman rekha which you can't cross it's always good to be in a business where risk and compliance is primary concern and we wanted that to be plugged in by getting him on the board the second and other equally important thing which uh, which not too many people will sink in with an idea but i always believe that if we want to really create a brand a brand is created only if we try to give a national image to whatever that we do ashish patia operates out of delhi i operate out of gift city gandhinagar mr dhananjay a south indian we said east west south yeah you know so i mean north west and south is what we need to capture within our team and we need to have balanced networks from each of these areas in our own way the two other gentlemen who support us they support only for due diligence on the legal paperwork once we have decided on the startup they have no role to play whether the startup is good bad or ugly all the other three members that i mentioned on the top they are all 
I mean, all of three of us have been in startup ecosystem in one or the other way. But the interesting thing, the next two slides, which I would quickly run through. Slide number one and two. This is the investment committee that we have. We have a 41 member investment committee besides me and Ashish and Dhananjay, spread across 11 different domains for us to take the call. So what we essentially do is if suppose there is a cyber tech company which we are evaluating, besides three of us here, this company will be presented to four members which are mentioned here in the cyber tech space. Take domain expertise into consideration and then make an investment. So we will, we are amongst those very few people who consider domain expertise to be of criticality before you take an investment decision in any startup. Because these are the people who can try the product if need be, who will have their connect to find out the meritocracy of the people behind that startup and all of the stuff. So while this num number looks large, 41 members, it's not that 44 members will together will be under one roof to decide which startup to invest in. If it is an energy company, it will be five plus three, eight of us which will decide. It's like this that we work on. Lastly, the most unique thing about this is after we have decided on which startup we want to invest in, we, we share a two-page, three-page note to our investors and say, this is a company which we, where we want to invest part of your money. If you write back to us saying that you do not invest my money into this startup because I don't like the face of the startup founder, I will not invest. So while this is fund management done by us, the final say is always going to be of the end investor for him or her to take a decision whether you want to invest or not. And there could be multiple reasons for us to do this. Recently, we invested in a company called Sapati based out of Bangalore. Kalari Capital, a very significant name in the uh, venture capital business, was owning 24% in this company. We liked the idea. We presented to some of our investors and few out of them came back to us and said, it's a great company, but we cannot invest in this company because they sell non-wet samosas, which is against our religious belief. We immediately said, when we launch our fund, we will give the same kind of uh, you know, opportunity to an investor for him to say yes and no for this. If you say no, your part of the money will not get invested in. And therefore, every investor that we manage will be customized to the extent of their liking in building the portfolio. The entire structure is who the bankers are, trusteeship and all, primarily this is of lesser relevance. What is the uniqueness about us? We feel that it's a very investor friendly and regulated fund structure. Portfolio being sector agnostic, adequately diversified. So generally speaking, this, is, this works well for somebody who is a first time investor in startups. We are entering at the time when valuations are going to be reasonable and focusing on exit. We have a belief that we'll be able to do good justice because of this reason. We have set up strong governance standards, uh, a great team in terms of domain experts as well. Uh, lastly, the investor discretion on individual startup is something which is another unique thing and backed up by people who have pedigree in the startup and wealth management space which is what makes us unique in that way. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Apurva, for briefing about your own uh, offering. Uh, we'll open the uh, forum for Q&A now. Uh, those who have any questions, they can type it in Q&A section. Uh, we'll talk, uh, take these questions one by one. Uh, meanwhile, I uh, already have one question. Uh, from an investor is asking about what will be the actual cash flow uh, for this investment. Because you said that the money. Good, good question. So the cash flow will be that for the first two years, you are paying money in installments. The first investment. So what our hypothesis is that we we invest with a mindset that we should ideally get an exit between three to five years. This is a wish list. But generally speaking, between four to five years is a very strong possibility. With that in mind, if someone invests today, for the first two years, you will keep investing money gradually and build the portfolio of 25 lakhs. For the next two years, there is practically nothing in the name of cash flows. 
your cash flows will begin from the fourth year onwards. As in when we exit out of those investments. And we will not be reinvesting any of this money. So the moment there is an exit, the money will be paid back to the investor. Uh, the first investment that we will make, if that's going to last for three to five years, that means that bulk of that portfolio should be exited within the five years or a little bit here and there. But the last investment that we will make will be at the end of the second year and I need to give five years time frame for that also. Therefore, the tenure of the fund is seven years. Okay. Um, the next question is, uh, can NRI invest in this fund? Yes, they, they can. Both NRI and NRO account is possible. Even US is possible. Okay. This is a completely regulated structure as well. Okay. Then the next question is from Mr. Sandeep. Uh, uh, Sandeep, sir, you can ask your question directly. We have... Yep. Good morning, Mr. Uh, Vora, yes. sir. F Good fantastic morning. presentation. Fantastic Thank presentation. You. It was very clear. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, please, sir. Please. Uh, one is, uh, you have shown the stages of investing. So here we are talking right. about at the Angel stage, we will enter. Correct. So and we will not will be. Yep. Typically, uh, we will start looking at opportunities post uh, Series A. So uh, sometimes even in Series A, but Series B is where we will be very serious in terms of looking at exits. And then exit will be at the uh, venture capital stage or at the time of listing. No, so listing is impossible. I don't think any of our company will reach the stage of IPO. We don't yeah. expect that to happen, to be frank. It will be, see, for every one single listing, this is an interesting statistics, which I will also incorporate in the presentation now. For every one single listed uh, company from startup ecosystem, there are easily about 40 odd mergers and acquisitions that have, this is the ratio. We would prefer to be part of that where the company is being acquired by someone else is our preferred mode of exit. The second choice will be selling it to uh, any other larger VC fund. Or there could be a strategic investor. And, and one thing which uh, I need to openly uh, share, the moment you go larger in terms of the value chain, the VC funds and the larger VC funds and all, they would always prefer all the angel investors to be out of the company shareholding by the time they invest. Right. This is the reason why angel investors do have exited. Right. The second question is, uh, you have talked about 12%, uh, uh, that's a uh, benchmark return, and then your share of 20%. So is that Correct. share of 20% is on the entire portfolio of 25 uh, lakhs, or is it on an individual? So for example, uh, if I invest 25 lakhs and maybe, you know, I have a share in five, uh, five different startups Correct. and maybe, you know, one workouts or works out out of five and then, you know, four Correct. goes down. Correct. Okay. So what happens, you know, do you get 20% on the entire portfolio of, uh, you know, five or just one? And then I have to swallow the loss of four. No. So it is on the entire portfolio. Uh, this is not on individual basis. So if there is a loss, uh, to that extent, we are partners to the loss and you will pay if at portfolio level, you make that money, not on the individual companies. Right. And you talked about a 2% uh, annual management fees uh, right. on that. So will right. it have to be paid separately every time because money will be no. invested? No. No, you will not pay anything separately. The, uh, this is something which will be part of the 25 lakhs that you are uh, giving me. All right. And so I will have, keep deducting out of that only. Sorry. Right. Right. And then, for example, if you have a startup and then you will have investors like me, you know, I mean, number of investors like me. And if one right. idea comes and, you know, and the interest is more than what you actually require for that particular uh, for that particular uh, startup, then how would you prioritize, you know, whom to give first and, you know, whom, whom to 
if you so here here that question doesn't arise for the simple reason that once i have my money let's put it that i have 150 crores of money which i have raised yeah and and out of 150 crores i have taken a decision that there is one startup which i like and i want to give an allocation of 3 crores to 5 crores to this particular startup yeah i will divide 5 crores across all the investors out of that whoever, whoever shows is, their interest whoever so shows their not, interest in no, so i will i will first of all keep this in mind that my tentative number will be 5 lakhs now it is not that see here you will not say no to most of it because of a simple reason that even if you say no let me be very frank here you don't have a right to increase the investment amount in a startup you don't have a right to decrease the investment amount per startup you can say no at best if you say no and if there are 20% of the investors who say no to a particular startup then my allocation to that startup will get reduced from 5 crores to 4 crores i will just because of you i will not increase the allocation percentage allocation to other investors that much for my commitment to startup will then go as four crores right right and you can't have a fixed exit period isn't it because We you might have certain startup of course yeah you know, some some may not actually would have seen the you know correct uh, light at the end of the tunnel and they are still in that process absolutely so also let me share so some interesting numbers let me uh, yeah. this is important for everyone all the startup funds that came in 2015 uh there is 94% of the capital which has been paid back to the investor 6% is still lying there only because there is no exitability there is nothing so on paper 94% of the capital is paid back those who came in 2017 right which is relatively recent 6 years only 0.3% i mean so, if, so when i say 0.3 it means 30% of the money is paid back to the investor in 6 years 70% of the capital is not paid back. but this 30% no, no. which is paid back the returns are almost 50% at portfolio level compounded annually so, so when you're saying 30% is paid back means 30% plus the return of 50% no 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 i'm talking 30% of the base capital return wise you make of the base capital ha ah. right so for example when you said uh, in 2014 or 2015 whatever was invested 96 percent is paid back. So, for example, yes, if it is 25 lakhs, the capital is paid back. Yeah, 94 percent. So, for 25 lakhs, whatever it is, 22 or 23 lakhs is paid right. back. How about right. the return? Return is still locked so in there. Returns is no, no. Returns have also been paid back. I am just counting capital today. Returns also is paid off. And the same right. table which I, mean, I showed. Yeah, yeah. And sorry, one more question. Sorry, I'm, I'm asking please, too please, many. Please, please, please. Um, I, I think. Uh, I think uh, uh, similar questions might have others also will have similar Very questions true. in mind. So uh, you know when you say twenty uh, your share of ten percent or what is that on the or twenty percent on the entire investment, you know after that after the twelve percent, uh, isn't it difficult to actually you know because different startups will mature at a different periods in time. You right. might have certain startups who have matured and done well in the beginning. but you might have something left out in the end which are not done uh, well or perhaps failed completely is very so how would you how would you take out your 20% you know uh, in this whole thing because uh, if the initially if it has done that well if you take 20% out of it fine you got that but you right. know i have a capital which i am going to lose in the later so how do i get that back so excellent excellent question i can only tell you one thing uh, in my uh last 10 days this question has come long back but in my last 10 days of 20 presentations i have made uh, this is a question which has come for the first time so let me first compliment you for this part uh the good th- good thing here is uh first as long as i return back the capital to you i am not entitled for my carry so that doesn't come in picture thereafter for every startup there would be this you know wherever there is a profit there is a 80 20 split and all happens sebi allows us to keep a little bit of a buffer uh, not buffer for us in that sense we keep doing this but towards the end when your returns do not really match up i have to fund back that money to you and give you the full accounting statement with every just 
so it may so happen that i may be under billing you or over billing you by 5% here and there on a relative basis that 5% is also not a large number but that is the difficulty of fund management because i can't predict what's going to happen 6 months down the line so i'll keep that much of money reserved and at every quarter when there is a invoicing that happens i'll keep deducting that that right and whatever money i get at the end of uh, uh, okay once that uh, startup story or the investment cycle finishes yes. certainly my capital is protected uh, you know for for that investment uh, no i do lose isn't it as yes, you lose uh, money isn't it? yeah correct correct you there is a there's a possibility theoretically there's a possibility of complete loss of capital if i were to put it this way if all 35 yeah. startups fail uh, anything is possible yeah so my uh, 25 lakhs will go in 35 startups is it correct yes pretty much if i say if i say yes to 35 if i say yes to 25 it will go in 25 yes correct that's okay thank you thank you so much okay now in extension to this what we will do is that if you say no to 10 ideas i will show replacement 10 ideas to you yeah if at all you say no to if you say no to five of those 10 ideas then the amount equivalent to those five companies will remain in cash for a very long time or after the investment period i will return back the cash to you because that will spoil my ir otherwise Right. And on that, I will not be entitled for twelve percent, right? No, of course you are not entitled for twelve percent on that. Yes, <laughs> and I'll be losing two percent as well. Yes. So our intention yeah. is that you say no to only those companies which you really have a very strong view that you don't want this company for an A B C reason. Right. The reason could be anything. It could be an area of your domain. If suppose somebody is a doctor and I am showcasing a health tech company. and the doctor feels that this health tech company will not do well for abc reasons i respect the judgment of the doctor for him to take a call not to invest yeah yeah again do i have an option to say i, I want to double down on that particular sector no unfortunately uh, you can't do that as well because that will spoil my commitments to the startup so i can't adjust right. that unfortunately okay thank you so much pleasure please Uh, we have a next question from mr malik uh, what have exit doesn't happen by the end of the fifth year or will the existing value of the capital return or have to wait until the listing okay the answer is actually uh, could be anything let me put it this way first is exit doesn't happen in five years is not a concern to anyone because if exit doesn't happen in 5 years exit may happen in 7 years also the tenure of the fund is 7 years and sebi allows a 2 year extension 1 plus 1 just to ensure that even the last startup you give a fair chance for a possible exit now let me give some exit scenarios suppose and i will take one or two live cases so that it's easy for anyone to understand there was one um, venture capital fund which we participated some time in 2017 one of the company in that is where this venture capital fund invested at a 19 crore valuation they invested 1.5 crores of money so they were owning about 78% in the company this 19 crore company which invested in 2016 december if i remember correctly has went on to become a 450 crore valuation company today the problem is the company is having 75 crores of cash in their balance sheet today they do not need any new fresh round of capital now there is value i know that my valuation is brilliant but what do i do with this valuation when there is no exit so now it means that that part of that portfolio where the value is great will unlock some day where i don't know when will the value unlocking happen and these are very practical cases so we have a reason to believe the value unlocking will happen value unlocking will happen because there is one another very large fund which invested 4 years back 3 and a half 4 years back this fund also has got a 6 year 7 year life cycle of its fund 
so now in another one year they will start putting pressure on this company that spend this 75 crores of money wherever you want to go global and develop international markets and all now in the name of developing international market this 75 crores will get wiped off in no time because the moment you want to develop that kind of market that scenario can happen potentially the moment that capital is being used this company will have to come in the market again to raise one more round of capital is the time this small money will get an exit so now the choice is you stay put for some more time and wait for this company to raise one more capital now because the investors have started putting pressure on this fund this guy has started looking in the secondary market saying is someone ready to buy up my stake now so they had reached out to us again i said i will buy this out but i will take it at a 30 percent discount i will take this in my fund now i like the company i know the company is doing very well if nothing else in five years this company will come with an ipo now right but current market valuation 450 crores i will not give you i'll i'll get a 30 percent discount then only i will take it so one third discount is what i'm asking for now the challenge for that particular fund which came in 2016 is he has told this to investors that the value of this company is 450 crores. If he sells in the market for 300 crores to give you an exit, you will say that it was the Pesa Khalia, which is not the case, right? Which is obviously not the case. So in order to get an exit early, you need to be ready for a certain discount. Now, 19 crores to 300 crores is still good enough jump that as a fund manager, I will not have a problem. I'm still returning good capital to the money. I'm happy. But investors must still come back and, and curse me for what I did. That's a difficulty in this kind of business. But exits, uh, this will give you an answer that exit scenario is that way challenging. And suppose if it doesn't happen even at that time, then you know, in the next year, year and a half, all these startups will be compulsorily in DMET mode. You will have units of my fund and in, uh, because even we are required to go and have an ISI number for our fund. You will continue to have an ISI number and I'm duty bound to manage that money perpetually. So if okay. there is an exit that happens, automatically you get an exit. Perfect. Uh, we have a next question on the tax structure. How the uh, fund is taxed at the hands of the investors? So this is a category once it's a pass through. Uh, it is always hand text and the end of the investor only. But this is 20% uh, with indexation. Is the taxation structure and we don't expect exits to happen before two years. So it is all long term capital gains. 20% with indexation is what will apply. And all those uh, reports will be given to the investors. Like this. everything will be available. So there is a quarterly commentary that will come in. We. Uh, we are duty bound to give a detailed third party audited valuation report once in a year. We also will be doing half yearly calls with all our investors in terms of giving update on the companies. And we are also very clear that every time when we do this kind of calls, uh, every time we will include, uh, we might not include all the companies because it's impossible to do that, but we will include two or three companies to share how their growth process have been. Uh, in the last some time. So each of them will be given five minutes each for them to give a briefing in terms of how these companies underlying investments are doing. So that you will have an idea and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but yes, half yearly be some kind of reporting which will be there, which will be uh, not audited though. Audited report will come one year. And there is a dashboard available to an investor to see the valuation of the portfolio and everything, including all reports, physical copy, downloadable and all. Uh, from that dashboard only and that all is live already so the moment we close the fund within the seven days the investor will have the login for him, to, him or her to be able to do that perfect we have next question uh, first about appreciation to you good presentation mr Vora, and thanks for the clarity. thank you uh, the question is you explained about the accelerator role would Brew Opportunities Fund take on the job of curation, mentorship, and grooming of startups? No, we will not do that. We are just investors. I, I uh, don't think we have the bandwidth to do that, nor is our intention to do uh, that role uh, of our own ever. Okay. 
I think we have one more question from Sandeep sir. Sandeep yes. sir. Yes sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is uh, do we become the direct shareholder in the startup when we invest? No. Uh, no, sir. You are an investor in an AIF, and AIF in turn will become the investor in the company. Now, okay. let me highlight so that it should not be a confusion to anybody in uh, in this. A lot of people believe that direct shareholder becoming a direct shareholder is a great advantage. Uh, we believe otherwise. Uh, not necessary unless you are really very large enough to do that. A couple of reasons. If you are a direct investor, it is you who will have to figure out your own exit. If it's a fund, it's easy for us to figure out an exit. That's point number one. But second and more important thing, if a startup founder starts taking too many people directly on its own cap table as direct shareholders, historically, it is uh, clear that no large venture capital fund would like to invest in a company where there are so many shareholders. If I am a large VC fund, I will be having a snobbish value that if Apuro Vora is a, is a retail person, he is also an investor in the company on the shareholders list. And I am also a shareholder. Then what's great I am doing here? Let me not even invest here then. So this is an industry where this ego is paramount and it is universal, being very frank with you. If a startup founder is, is starts taking investments from a lot of retail investors, Invariably, this founder will not be able to manage money from other investors or large qualified investors. Right. right. Uh, one more question, uh, because you, yes. you, bro, you you spoke one word, which is perpetuity. Okay. Yes. Well, fund might be perpet in perpetuity, but we all are not in perpetuity. Absolutely, so yes. Correct. And you have also spoken about... Uh, you know, you are a core team of three people and where, uh, you know, one gentleman, I don't remember the name, who is more part of the risk management. Uh, Got it. Okay. And that risk management is part of the investments which you guys are doing, are going to do in Got the... It. Got it. Angel. What about Got it. the risk management of the fund itself uh, in terms okay. of uh, succession uh, or anything? You know, if, if anything happens to the, you know, one of the core team members, then, Correct. you know, uh, what, what is your uh, risk management studies there? Uh, absolutely uh, brilliant. So let me explain. Finwall as a joint venture is not a joint venture between Apurva Vora and Ashish Bhatia. It is two entities, Finolutions and India Accelerator. Finolutions, it's, it's a firm that I started 10 years back. So let me tell you about this first. Yes, today there is a key man risk in, in me because... Uh, I am the front face of the company and I've been running it for 10 years. Interestingly enough, uh, just about four months back, we have roped in a new managing partner just because of that we wanted to have, have a succession plan in our business. So a new managing partner has been roped in. He comes with money. So there is skin in the game for him now, uh, for him to run the show. Uh, I mean, I don't mind sharing here as well. At 58, I have a certain timeline in my mind for me to phase out effective uh, involvement. But there is a second line which is already getting created. And there is every dilution that I do in terms of my shareholding will have uh, uh, the same thing uh, becoming more professional in nature. India Accelerator on the other side is started by 11 people together. So there are 11 founders, co-founders. So Finolutions has two co-founders today. Uh, India Accelerator has got 11. Even if there are key men risk, thinking of key men risk, what, 13 people together is a rarity. Yeah. That's, that's one part. We have thought about everything. So your question is very valid and I respect this question. Uh, when I said perpetuity, it also means that, see, by the way, India Accelerator uh, as, a, as a JV partner adds a lot of strength because of this also. For anyone to run an accelerator is not an easy job. Two lakh square feet of office space for you to run. And if you don't charge a single rupee to a startup and you make money only when the startups grow, it's a hugely capital intensive business. Uh, we have seven centers in Delhi of India Accelerator. In partnership with the government of UAE, there is an accelerator which works in Dubai. There is an invitation that we have to set up something in, uh, in Saudi. Because if you do something in Dubai, Saudis will always call you in three months. 
Uh, we already have an accelerator in US. It's a corporate structure. There are a lot of significantly large investors in India accelerator as investors in this. So it's a corporate entity. It is not run by a few individuals. So we have thought about that in that sense. And when I say perpetuity, it also means that after a while, if you don't get an exit in the company in seven or nine years, it actually speaking is a write-off. There will be a stage where we will go to the auditors and say that if there is nothing else happening, you just value this company one more time. Tell me what it is. Otherwise, we write off. And if there is no value in the company, um, yeah, you know, a write-off is not going to hurt anybody, including you as an investor. Okay. Thank you so much. Please. Thanks, sir. Uh, we'll take the last question of the session. Uh, there's a question that uh, would you entertain investors who do not fit into a SEBI definition of accredited investors? Or do you need any kind of proof sort of thing for investors? Okay. So, so honestly speaking, I don't need a proof, but I need only one thing. A self-declaration that you are a SEBI accredited investor. Now, let me also tell you the risk factors in this case. When someone says that I'm a SEBI accredited investor. Let me take an example. Uh, a lot of people here, in, especially in Gujarat, we have seen that somebody who is wealthy enough, and why only Gujarat? It's, it's across the board. If somebody is wealthy enough, the family wealth is divided across all the names of the family, plus one HUF created, plus something else created. So collective wealth could be 10 crores. In one single file, you might not find two crores possible. Now, it is at that time the investor who takes a call. An investor says, I am. I'm SEBI accredited. I have no ways to prove that whether the person is or not. But let's understand if someone says that I'm an accredited investor, invest in this, pays 10 lakhs. And after that, the person has inability to pay the remaining three installments of five lakhs each. SEBI allows me to forfeit the units of that investor. Right? That is one. Now, that's not my intention to do. Even for that investor who has given money to me with all good intention and is not able to honor the other commitments, if I forfeit, legally I'm doing right, but morally I, I feel little bad for me to do that. So what we have taken a stance is in that case, we will offer the same units to the existing investors and say there is one investor who has committed 10 lakhs, wants an exit. You give a quotation at which you would want to buy this out. I'm very sure. There will be people who would really, if it is a performing asset, why would somebody not want to buy it out? Now, it is up to uh, the bidding. Somebody might get nine, somebody will give nine and a half lakhs, somebody will quote eight. And that at price, you take your money out. So rather than getting forfeited, you take your eight lakhs and walk out. And that's an option. Suppose, hypothetically, you disagree on that also. <laughs> saying that, no, I don't want to sell for 8 lakhs. In that scenario, at least internationally, in, the, in India, that is under consideration while I have my doubt whether SEBI will do that or not. Globally, the way it is done is, as a fund, I am allowed to manage even 10 lakhs in that case. But I will charge the fees for the entire 25 lakhs. So your operating costs will become very high. I doubt whether SEBI will allow me to do that in India while it is in discussion because that means that any, I can still go in the market, plant very easily to somebody and say, you give me 10 lakhs, I will manage. I can violate the SEBI rule of 25 lakhs very easily. And SEBI will not pinpoint anything onto you as investors. But SEBI's eyes would always be on me that if I am doing mis-selling by talking about 10 lakhs to people or what. At that time, I will have to showcase and say, look, the investor had given this declaration that the investor's worth is two crores or higher. Now you go out and check. I have not asked investors not to pay. Most unlikely that SEBI will give a call to an investor to figure out whether you are an accredited investor or not because SEBI has too many other things to do. But I'm giving theoretically all the scenarios to you as it is. The best option is you take a secondary exit, which we will facilitate is the best opportunity. Thanks. Thanks, Apurva. This was really yes. wonderful. Thanks for giving. Absolute pleasure. Um,
the entire okay. stuff. Uh, we express some heartfelt gratitude to all the participants and we all like the sessions. If you have Great. please, or if you need any further information, please reach out to your respective advisors. Uh, we look forward to meeting you all in our next Penta Talk series again. And before we end, <clears throat> a disclaimer. Of course, it is important to note that startup is an asset class which can be risky with the possibility of complete loss of capital. Thank you so much once again. Goodbye. Take care and have a great weekend ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.